Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Dan Vellante, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at the Sales University. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's presentation of the Virtual Scholar Series. Today is the 20th anniversary of the chemistry demonstrations. We would like to welcome everyone, whether you're watching from Zoom or whether you're watching on Facebook Live for tonight's virtual premiere, which are presented by our DeSales Science faculty, staff, and students. There will be a live Q&A following the program, and we ask that you put your questions in the chat box, whether they're here on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook Live. I would now like to introduce my co-host for this evening, Jackie Parker, the Director of Affinity and Campus Engagement, who is coming live from the Hertz Science Auditorium in the Priscilla Payne Heard Science Center at the Sales University. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Thank, Thank you so, so much. We are so excited, excited to be here today. today. I'm here with Dr. Um, Roger Burke, Dr. Francis Mayville. I'm here with um, Rania Nima and Kobe Rush. And they, and have, they put have put so, so much hard work in today's program. program. Dr. Burke, you want to tell us a little, about, a little bit about what our audience is about to see? Absolutely, Jackie. Uh, thank you for uh, Tuning in, uh, you are going to see something for the first time that we have not done. Uh, this is a unique year for Chem Demos program. Uh, it's the 20th annual, but we've never done a video such as this before. Everything has been in person. We've done no in person programs for Chem Demos this year. Uh, I have previewed the video, it is excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I want to thank uh, Rania our senior leader and Kobe, our junior leader. This has been a real challenge, but if it weren't for Jackie Parker and Jacob Metzger, uh, this video would not be possible. And of course, I also want to thank my colleague, uh, Fran Mayville. I'm looking forward to it. I think all of us are looking forward to it. So let's get on and look at the video and watch the video. See you too. I'm working on a demonstration for our chemistry demonstrations program. Oh, that's great. But remember, we have to get downstairs because that program is going to start pretty soon. Yeah. How can I help? Uh, but I really want to do this. What All I'm right. going to do is I'm going to set it up. And now what I want you to do is once a reaction occurs, okay. I want you to light the match and burn the acetylene that's produced in the reaction. Okay. All right. Okay? Well, I'll get the, the meter stick with the match on it Okay. and get it ready. Dr. Mavo. I'm going to now add some ice to this tray, and then after I have the ice on the tray, I'm going to sprinkle some calcium carbide, and you want to be ready, once I sprinkle the calcium carbide, you want to, want to be ready to light the acetylene gas that's produced in the reaction. Wow, that's Whoa. amazing! Whoa! I never thought it would be that big! It's great! Whoa! So you know what? We really do need to get to the show, so we got to put this fire out, then get downstairs. Yeah, the show. because it's our 20th anniversary, and we've got 14 yes. demonstrations that have fire and explosion and magic. Let's get going. Let's go. Let's All go. Right. Come on. Lead the way. Oh, maybe we should put that fire out first. Oh, let it burn. I'm literally starving. When are we going to eat? You said it. I have no idea. I've been dying to try this steel spaghetti. I've heard good things about it, and I need to get more iron in my diet if I want to get strong. Exactly. Excuse me. When is our food going to be ready? I'm sure it's almost ready. I can go check the back for you if you want. He better be quick. We've been waiting here 30 minutes. He is definitely not getting a good tip. Honestly, I think we should probably just leave. Oh, here he is. Here you guys go. I hope you enjoy. It's our finest. That's it? Yeah, that's only like two grams. Shouldn't we get more? I mean, I, I guess I can get you more. Just give me one second. I'll be right back. Wait, don't you want our plate? All right. This should only take a second. What are you doing? Shouldn't the cook be doing this? Well, actually, I am the cook. We'll get this going for you in just a second. Mm. 
we go. Hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. It's gonna go a little toasty. Not too bad. Just a little bit more. And there we go. I think you'll find this a little bit more to your liking. Wow, you sure did give us more, a whole half a gram more. And it's overcooked. Can we speak to your manager? Certainly. Actually, I am the manager. How can I help you folks tonight? All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that demo, the Steel Spaghetti Spectacle, with myself, Leah, Heather, and Kobe. And this demo is all about oxygen, concentration, and surface area. But before we get into those topics, let's talk about the materials we use today. For the reaction, we use steel wool, oxygen from that oxygen cylinder, and we use a lighter to get everything going. But for the whole setup that wasn't in the reaction, we had a beaker, we had a couple clamps, a rain stand, an iron ring, some tubing, and oxygen cylinder itself. And the whole point of this was to create a safe environment where we could conduct this as well as increase the concentration of oxygen within a given area. So let's dive into it a little bit more. So the first thing we want to talk about is the combustion reaction that went along here with regards to the oxygen. So a combustion reaction involves a substance reacting with oxygen, releasing energy in the form of light and or heat, which we saw in this reaction. The steel wool caught on fire and it was burning really bright. Even parts were flying off of it. It had so much energy. And this also allowed the system to gain mass. So when we take a look at this reaction up here, we see that it involved the iron, oxygen, and they both come together to form an iron oxide. The iron starts at like 55.845 grams per mole, oxygen at 32, and iron oxide at about 160. Now, we didn't use a mole of everything, but these are the ratios that we used. So when we take a look at the whole mole equation, we see that we would use 223 grams of the iron the oxygen would have been 96, and they both combine to make 320. So in conclusion, we gain mass. It's not like when you burn your homework and say your dog ate it, this actually increased. So it's a really cool trick, but don't try this at home. Now, concentration was also used to help this reaction go really well. So concentration put really easily is how much stuff is in a given space. Just like in your classroom, there might be a bunch of people in a really big space, so it might not be a big concentration as if you were all packed into a closet, which, given the times right now, wouldn't be the best idea. So in our system right here, the oxygen all piled up in that beaker, which is why there's a tube going up. The oxygen was going right in there. And since that was needed for the reaction, it allowed it to go super fast. And I know what you might be thinking. We breathe oxygen. Isn't there enough in the atmosphere? And there is, but it won't burn nearly as bright. That's why we kept pulling the steel wool inside and out of the system, because you could see the differences in how vigorous the reaction was. And finally, surface area was a big aspect to this reaction. The steel wool wasn't really condensed into a like baseball, but it was spread out with all its fibers everywhere. And that's because that increases the surface area, the total area that the surface of an object occupies. So when we take a look at these two objects right here, we have the blue rectangle and the two green ones, which both are like the same size, but one of them's chopped in half, exposing more surfaces. So which do you think has the greater surface area? Well, if we put some oxygens around this system, we see there are about 10 on the left, and we have 12 on the right. And we can take a look. There are two extra ones right there in the middle. So in conclusion, the surface area allows us to react even more because there's more surfaces for the oxygen to react. I hope you guys enjoyed this demo, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day as well. I am so glad that school's out, but it is way too hot. Oh, I'm sweating like crazy. I know, I wish we had some snow. This is way too crazy. Ha ha! Not so fast, youngsters. I have the product for you that'll make those frowns turn upside down. Hi, I'm Phil Snowstorm, and I'd like to introduce my product, InstaSnow. What is it, you ask? Well, have you ever looked outside in your backyard and seen all that dry grass? Have you ever seen uh, 
so many spotted lanternflies and you've had to kill your fifth one today? Well, not anymore. You will be uh, playing in so much snow, you won't know what to do with it. Watch as I perform. Whoa, he's making snow, guys. Wow. Yes. See, Whoa. it's snow. And you can play with it too. You can make snowmen, you can go sledding in it. You oh can do my whatever gosh. you want. That's perfect. Whoa. Yeah. All right, check this out. How do we get more? Well, I'm glad you asked. You can purchase it at any local convenience store for $99.99. $99.99? That's yes. way too expensive. Forget it. We don't want that. What? Oh. My demo was Winter Wonderland. I'm Anthony Sino, and the other uh, members in my group were Vanya, Matt, and Kobe. So my materials I needed for this experiment, I needed 5 grams of sodium polyacrylate uh, with a thousand mil, uh, 500 milliliters of H2O as well. You just need a one gram uh, of sodium polyacrylate proportion to 100 milliliters of water. Um, you just need two 1,000 milliliter beakers to measure this, as well as a 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder. So, what is sodium polyacrylate? Sodium polyacrylate is a super absorbing cross linked chain. Um, it's also known as a polymer, and a polymer is a substance that has a molecular structure of many repeating or similar units. Um, you can think of a polymer as a train and the different compartments being a monomer. So as you can see here, the compartment is just the one singular monomer, whereas the polymer is the many repeating units. And I also said it was cross-linked, and this is basically connections between the large molecular subunits, uh, which keep it intact. So the reaction basically consists of the water rushing in and separating the sodium cations and the carboxylate anions. The, carbo uh, the polymer then unwinds and unravels and expands with the crosslinks keeping the polymer intact. And this, as you saw in the experiment, makes it look like fake snow. So as I said, the result, it looks like fake snow. The process can be reversed. By, by using salt or NaCl, and the characteristics of the substance is it looks cold and uh, even at warm temperatures, such as snow. So the uses of salt, uh, sodium polyacrylate, um, it's a key ingredient uh, used in a lot of hygienic and cosmetic products, such as baby, baby powders, skin conditioning, and hair fixture. And this has, used, uh, has been used as fake snow before, um, in movies such as It's a Wonderful Life, uh, uh, going back to 1946, it's been used numerous times in movies. Ah, uh, yes, welcome to Matthias' kitchen. Today we're going to be learning how to cook an egg without using any heat or any conventional method. I just have to find the perfect ingredient. Uh, you guys can work on that as well, I look. Ah, yes, this is the one. Oh. Sacre bleu, this egg is cooked. Chef no. Matthew, you are a genius. Amazing. No, no, that was not <laughs> supposed to happen. What? What are you doing? No. <laughs> oh, no. Ha, ha, ha. What are you doing to no. my egg? She's just ruined. You ruined it. Now we have no more egg. Donnez-moi les petites bubbles, s'il vous plaît, mon ami! Get out of my kitchen now, sir! So, my demo is called Exploring Proteins and in relation to goggle safety as well, which we will get into. My name is Matthew Rita, and my partners were Ryan Yename, Kobe Rush, and Anthony Sino. So, the materials we used for this lab were just one egg, six moles of molar hydrochloric acid. 
10% uh, sodium bicarbonate solution and the hydrochloric acid is the acid in this demo and the bicarbonate solution is the base. Uh, crystallization dish to hold the egg and a pipette to add things. So in this lab we're going to talk about protein denaturation. And proteins are large molecules that are found in our bodies such as our eyes and our muscles as well and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. They're made up of smaller components called amino acids and these amino acids are held together by peptide bonds. And in denaturation, the hydrogen bonds are broken and the peptide bonds remain. Uh, I have a diagram here showing the different structural levels of a protein. Uh, in the case of an egg that's just been cracked, it's in the quaternary or fourth structure where the uh, assembled subunits of the protein are functional. And when the acid or a base is added, uh, in the case of this demo, the primary structure remains, which is just the amino acids held together by the peptide bonds. So as you can see, the structure is normal uh, before you add anything to it. And in the case of adding an acid, it appears to be cooked. Uh, it's not necessarily the same as if you were to cook with uh, heat, but if you add HCl, as we did in this lab, that's what causes the denaturation or unraveling of this protein, and it causes it to be non-functional. So in relation to goggle safety, uh, similar to the proteins in egg whites, there are proteins in your eyes that can also become denatured if acid comes into contact with them. And that can cause permanent damage, such as blindness. And the opposite of an acid, a base, will not reverse this process of denaturation as it is a very extreme process that cannot really be reversible. So the main message to take home is to protect your eyes and wear goggles in a safety lab setting. Thank you guys. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to our annual strength competition. These contestants today are going to be showing us their grip strength and showing us who is the strongest in this year's competition. So please help me welcome our first contestant, Matthew Rita. Woo! All right, Matthew, let's see what you've got. The can's all yours. That should do it. All right, let's take a look. Um, great, great effort, Matthew. Let's let's give it up for Matthew, everyone. All right, great job. Um, let's see if our next contestant has a little more strength than what Matthew showed us today. He's big. He's strong. Help me welcome Anthony Cino. Woo! Easy. Watch this. Oh, look at that. All right, let's see what Anthony's got. Great job, Anthony. Looking good, looking good. All right, and now we have our last contestant. Everyone, please help me welcome Granny Irma. Step aside, bucko. Let me show you how it's done. Whoa, Granny. And it looks like we have a winner. Our winner this year is Granny Irma. Uh. <laughs> All right, so my demonstration was called Crushed It, and it featured myself, Rania, Kobe, Matthew, and Anthony. So the materials we used in this demonstration were an aluminum soda can, water to fill the bottom of the can, an ice water bath that we filled in a 1,000 milliliter beaker, a hot plate to heat up the water that's inside the can, and tongs to flip the can over. So what happened in this demonstration was due to the gas laws, and gas laws are just laws that discover the relationship between pressure, volume, temperature, and the amount of gas. So the ideal gas law combines all those variables into one for the perfect gas. And the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles, 
R is the gas constant, which is the same in every equation, and T is temperature. And the ideal gas law can further be broken down to show the relationships between certain variables. So Charles' law, which is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, shows the direct relationship between volume and temperature. So that means that as the temperature is increasing, the volume also increases. Boyle's law is P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2, and that shows the indirect relationship between pressure and volume. That means that as the volume increases, the pressure is decreasing. And in our demonstration today, we see Gay-Lussac's law, which is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, and this shows the direct relationship between pressure and temperature. So that means that as the temperature is increasing, the pressure also increases because the particles are moving a lot faster. So in our demonstration today, we are heating up water that's inside the can, and we're turning that water into water vapor. The water vapor is trying to escape from the top of the can to try to equalize the pressure inside and outside the can. Once we flip the can over, we put it in cold water, and that cold water turns the water vapor back into a liquid form. So because we had a decrease in pressure, we're decreasing the amount of gas that's inside the can and also decreasing the pressure that's inside the can. So now the atmospheric pressure that's outside the can is much greater than inside, and the air molecules outside can push inward and crush the can as we saw in our experiment today. Thank you. All right. Sister and brother, I have finished. My concoction is complete. Wow, you really are just such a potion master, sister. Indeed. Never again will we have to put up with stains. Guys, guys, I really need your help. I, my, my wife is off on a business trip and I, I accidentally spilled juice all over her favorite top. I, I, I know you guys are, are really powerful, so if you have anything that can help me, I'll give you anything. Anything, if you can help me with this problem. Anything, huh? We'll discuss payment later. But I have a thing just for you. I just finished it. This is my magic erasing powder. It could take the stain out of anything. Let me show you. Notice that this liquid right now is black. It has come from the cranberry juice and my magic powder. But when I put it in here, it comes out clear and colorless. Well, that's yeah. perfect. Not a single stain to be found. Thank you, that's exactly what I need. Now, we can discuss payment, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the magic erasing powder demo with me, Leah, Kobe, and Carl. Me and me, Heather. <laughs> uh, the materials I used were activated charcoal powder, a Buchner funnel, a vacuum tube, 90 milliliters of cranberry juice, ring, a ring clamp and support stand, stirring rod, a 250 milliliter beaker, and a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. And the chemical concepts in here are the adsorption and the water purification via activated carbon. So in this demo, activated charcoal is a carbon that has been activated by heating it with steam, oxygen, or carbon dioxide. That's what makes it activated. And this results in a finely divided solid with an extremely large surface area, which is a very porous uh, structure. And this leads to the activated charcoal having a high adsorption capacity, meaning it can absorb and adhere um, ions, molecules, and atoms from other substances onto other substances, usually a solid. And in this specific demonstration, uh, the um, activated charcoal uh, took in the indicator dyes from the um, cranberry juice, which gives it its natural red color. And when it took in those dyes, it left the liquid clear and colorless. Thank you. Change. There you go. Thank you. There once was a wealthy man and his friend, and his sole purpose in life was to stir warm liquids with a spoon. On their walk, they came across a poor beggar woman. Spare change. <laughs> you want me to help you? Can't you see we're in the middle of something right now? Yeah, we're kind of busy here. Do you really think that I would consider even sparing a penny for you? The only thing that matters in life is stirring warm liquid with a spoon. So, I think we gotta get going.
May you never stir liquid with a spoon again. No! Okay, so this demonstration was titled The Man and His Spoon, and it featured myself, Kobe, Leah, Rania, and Angela. So what I used in this demonstration was a spoon made out of gallium. To do this, I used a silicon mold with screws, um, and I injected the liquid gallium into the mold and let it freeze in the freezer to, to solidify it. So we want to talk about melting points. A melting point is the temperature at which a substance goes from a solid to a liquid. The melting point of gallium, which is what I made the spoon out of, is 85.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, room temperature is less than that at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, but the temperature of human skin is higher than that at 91 degrees Fahrenheit, which means if you held gallium in your hand, it would melt on its own. To compare it to some other metals, uh, we have this table over here. So something like aluminum, uh, brass, bronze, cast iron, all these metals have really, really high melting points, close to, uh, it, most of them are above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So what does melting point depend on? It's based on how tightly bound uh, how tightly bound atoms and molecules are to each other. There has to be enough heat in order to tear those intermolecular bonds apart. So something that's bonded in a, a strong, highly ordered way is going to take a lot of heat energy to break those forces. Um, so something like salt, for example, has positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions together in a really well-ordered way. This means it takes a lot of heat energy to pull them apart, so it has a really high melting point. Gallium, however, is not structured like this. Gallium is not structured like salt in a highly ordered way. It's structured more like that image on the right. They form uh, what are called dimers, which are basically pairs of atoms. So the, the pairs of atoms are tightly bound together but the dimers are not tightly bound to each other, so they can flow past each other pretty easily. So all it took was a, a slightly warm liquid to melt the gallium spoon. Um, yeah, thank you. Same. I just want to go home. Come on, guys. We've only been out here for like five weeks. What, what's not to love out here? You got all the grass, you got some trees, you know, like it's perfect. No. Mm -mm. Well, can I at least show you guys something interesting? Mm, okay. okay. Sure. Well, sure. You, you see this mountain here? Yeah. Well, it's actually a volcano. No, it's not. Oh, yeah, it is. And I'm going to show you guys right now. You ready? Okay. I guess. It's probably going to be boring. My demo was called An Eruption of Chemistry. I was uh, made, performed by Nick Zambo, which is myself, and my partners were Nathan and Trisha. So the materials I used for this demo are ammonium dichromate, a sparkler for uh, the wick, and a lighter to light it. So what's happening in this demo? So basically the reaction happening here is a decomposition reaction, and this is basically a reaction in which a compound breaks down into two simpler products. So here is a more specific reaction. You have ammonium dichromate as a solid on the left, and when it's lit, it, it, it reacts to form the products of chromium-3 oxide and nitrogen gas as well as water vapor. 
Now, the reason that the color changes in this reaction is due to the change in the oxidation numbers. So as you can see here underneath the uh, equation, some of our uh, products and reactants are being oxidized and reduced. So our main uh, concern here, which was the chromium, is being reduced from a plus six oxidation state to a plus three oxidation state. And in order to get these electrons, it takes the electrons from the nitrogen, which is found in the reactant, which goes from a negative three oxidation state to zero oxidation state in nitrogen gas. Any questions? Thank you. Very dust. The world keeps changing and it's breaking my heart. Please, it's not enough. It's Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So I would like, first of all, to thank you all for the 10 followers. It's really an honor, like I'm so happy that I've reached this milestone in my life. I think I'm dropping out of college and just pursuing this as a career. This is my friend Kobe, say hi Kobe. Hi Kobe. So, <laughs> Kobe here is going to learn how to do rainbow flames. Kobe, what's your favorite thing about my YouTube channel? You know, I, I really like the editing, it's like... Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Kobe would like to be a YouTuber too, but for today he's just going to be my assistant. So, to make rainbow flames, we have lithium chloride, calcium chloride, barium chloride, copper sulfate, um, potassium chloride, and nitrogen chloride. And we'll see how all these colors come up. Kobe, do you want to hold the match? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. All right, Kobe, and then you just put them on each one. So like this. And then we just give it a second. And as you can see, each one is giving off a different color. Oh, wow. Yep. You like it, Kobe? Yeah. All right. I'm glad, Kobe, I can inspire, inspire you in life, you know? And then that'll be it. You can cut it. All right. So my experiment was the rainbow flames, and it was done by me and Kobe Rush. So the materials I used for the experiments were a beaker. I used around four um, milliliters of ethanol. You first add water to the, all the solutions because you have to have it damped a little and then you add the ethanol to it. So why did we get different colors? So we first have to understand what an electron is. An electron is a negative charge outside an atom. We all know that there is a proton and a neutron inside the atom, and then the outside of it has an electron. So whenever we heat up these electrons, they get excited and they go to a higher energy level. And then the, when the energy level starts dropping, they start getting quantums of energy, and the difference in quantums of energy gives us different colors. So to understand the different colors, we have to understand what a wavelength is. The wavelength is um, the range, which goes from 700 nanometers, which is a dark red, to 400 nanometers, which is a violet. And then the different colors we saw from the flames show us where at, is that molecule falling in that range. Gosh, I'm so scared. It's okay. I don't know. The power must have gone out because yeah. of the storm. Oh my goodness. Wait, I have an idea. I learned this in science class. We can power the generator. Come on. Really? How does it work? Yeah. Here, come closer. Here, watch this. <gasps> See? Oh my <gasps> the power's it, back it worked, on! The way! Yay! Actually, I just turned the generator on downstairs. But that's a really cool science project. Aww. <laughs> Hi, my name is Trisha, and I did the thermal powered pinwheel uh, experiment with Nathan and Nick. So, my materials you just need um, two straws. Um, scissors, a ruler, construction paper, a 
couple tea candles and a pin or a needle just to poke a hole in the paper. So um, this experiment, everything is going to be about kinetic energy. So first off, we're going to start with the burning of the candle. So there is a combustion reaction happening. So you have the wax that's reacting with the oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and heat. Now that heat is crucial to what's going to happen. So that kinetic energy is going to transfer to the air around it. So what you have is the cold air that's around the flames and the um, kinetic energy from the candle is going to transfer to the air surrounding it, causing it to increase in temperature and increase in volume. And as that happens, um, wh while the temperature and the volume increases, the density decreases. So that uh, less dense air is going to rise. And as it rises, it's taking that kinetic energy with it. So then that kinetic energy is going to hit the pinwheels, giving it enough energy to start rotating and spinning. Let's see what she's doing. Come, my children. You get one question. What can I do for you? Well, I'd be rich in the future. Oh, the crystals are glowing. Your future will be very bright and full of riches. Will I find my true love? The crystals are sparking. There, are, there will be sparks flying in your future. What about me? not really sparking anymore, but you will be rich. Oh, okay. So this is called The Gypsy, and it's by me, Maddie, Angela, Leah, and Heather. So the materials I used was an inorganic phosphate, or an inorganic compound called triphenylphosphine dipyridine isothiano cyano copper one, and the chemical formula is underneath. Then there's a UV light and a mortar and pestle. So in the first uh, request, when the light was first shown on the crystals, they illuminated and they uh, phosphoresced. So the electrons in the crystalline structure increased. The higher they were in energy, the higher energy level they went to. However, when the light was not no longer emitted and uh, gave energy to these electrons, they returned back to their ground electron state. But unlike uh, fluorescence, where they immediately returned to their state, Phosphorescence takes these alternative pathways to, so it takes longer for them to get back to their state. So unfortunately, like the light was not shown on them long enough, but if it was, you would see these crystals going for a long period of time afterwards because it takes so long for the electrons to get back to their ground state. And the second request, when the uh, crystals started to spark, a force was applied by the pestle and it caused this crystalline structure to fracture and crack. This created a negative side of the, on the crack and a positive side on the crack. In order to neutralize, because it wants this unstable uh, compound wants to neutralize, electron will be transferred from the negative side to the positive side. And as it does this, the nitrogen that's in the air all around us will increase in energy very suddenly and then very suddenly release it, causing the sparks in the, the air that you saw. However, there's too much humidity in the air today, so that's why the sparks were not present. But normally that is what you would have seen. And in the third request, the crystals do not spark because once there is no longer a crystalline structure to neutralize, the sparks will no longer be present when you grind them. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the race that you've all been waiting for. Today, we have an incredible matchup between the gummy bear queen herself, Trisha, Woo! and the pasta king, Nick. Ooh, ooh, they will be competing for the coveted carbohydrate champion. Queen Trisha will be using gummy bears as her source of fuel, while Nick will be using pasta noodles. Racers, to your places. On your marks. Ready, go. <laughs> And it looks like Gummy Bear Queen Trisha is the winner! Woo! So my demonstration was called Sugar Rush, and I'm Nathan, 
and my group members were Nick and Trisha. So the materials that we used for this demonstration were five to seven grams of potassium chlorate, and the equipment that we used were two Pyrex test tubes, two ring stands with clamps, tongs, a Bunsen burner, um, gummy candy bear, I mean, candy gummy bear, and a piece of pasta noodle. So the first thing that needs to occur is the decomposition of potassium chlorate. So carbohydrates or saccharides are sugars that are used as fuel for energy. By heating potassium chlorate, it is decomposed and oxygen is produced. So below we can see the reaction where on the reactant side we have our potassium chlorate and it's decomposed into the salt potassium chloride and we produce oxygen. So the reaction that actually takes place is the oxidation of monosaccharides. So the oxygen will oxidize the carbohydrate, and in this case, with the gummy bear, it is glucose in the gummy bear. And this oxidation reaction is incre incredibly exothermic, meaning that it releases a lot of heat and energy. So below, we can also see the reaction taking place, where on the reactant side, we have glucose with the oxygen that was produced in the previous decomposition, and it produces carbohydrate, or uh, carbon, carbon dioxide, and water in addition to heat. So we had two different types of saccharides in this experiment. We used monosaccharides and polysaccharides. So monosaccharides are the simplest form of sugar and the most basic unit of carbohydrates. Polysaccharides are the polymeric carbohydrate molecule made of long monosaccharide chains bonded by glycosidic bonds. And below we can see two examples of these. So for the example of a monosaccharide, we have glucose. And for the example of a polysaccharide, we have amylose, which is also called starch. So during the reaction, you might have taken notice that the starch reacted slower and it took longer for it to begin. And this is because polysaccharides must be broken down into monosaccharides by a process called hydrolysis before they can be used as fuel. Thus, the reaction takes a longer time to begin. And below, we have an example of a hydrolysis reaction of a disaccharide, which is basically two monosaccharides. Thank you. Hey guys, come over here ladies. Let's come see my earth saving solution. What do you got? So this solution, it could help clear the air. It could get rid of air pollution and water pollution. Plus there's a little something extra after you see it in action. What do you guys say? You think it's worth it? How does it do that if it just looks like a clear liquid? Yeah, I don't believe that either. Well, let me show you with a demonstration. So, as I add this liquid into this, up and see it's all a little green and yucky. As soon as I add my earth saving solution, it becomes clear and blue. That's amazing. This is extraordinary. Hang on, you said it could also clear air pollution? How, would, how does it do that? All right, well, you still see this red gas coming out. Let's capture some of that in this and see. Let's stop it and see how it's red and stuck. You're going to add some of my earth saving solution to help clear up this air. I cast off it again and I shake it and guess what it does? What? It comes clear. Don't you see? That's incredible. That is a tonic worth buying. Oh Getting my. a whole case. But wait, there's an extra part. I'm going to take this piece of blue paper and let me dip it in that same solution. It comes out red. Imagine what this could wow. do with your hair, or your tile, or your wall paint. You don't have to pay for paint anymore. I need some right now. Where can I get it? Right here. It's only $50 a bottle. We're Assistant, ready. we need you. Absolutely. This is a perfect oh. bottle. Where's that labeling machine that you have there so I can put it on this case of water for the customer? You are supposed to have that done two hours ago. Oops. Um, we'll be right back. All right, so this was Earth Saving Solution by Shannon, Heather, Angela, and Leah. So for our materials, we had the sidearm filtering flask, a 300 milliliter graduated cylinder, the long thin thing. We had rubber stoppers for both the tubes. Then I had one gram of the copper metal pellets, and then also one gram of copper turnings, which is also like copper wire. And then 25 ml of nitric acid, water, blue litmus paper, and of course, the fume hood. 
So what happens in the first step is an oxidation reduction reaction. We have copper metal is then mixed with that nitric acid, which then goes to copper ions with nitrogen dioxide, which was the orange gas, and then water was produced in the little cylinder in the flask at the bottom. So the reason this is oxidation reduction is because the copper metal starts with an oxidation number of zero, and then it goes to an oxidation number of plus two. So it lost electrons, meaning it oxidized. And then the nitric acid originally had a charge of positive one, and then it goes to zero, so it gained electrons, meaning it got reduced. So basically, by adding my earth-saving solution or water into the filtering flask, what happens is it becomes a coordination complex with the copper ions. So it goes from that murky green color with the gas, and then the copper ions, when water is added, they get attracted, and so the oxygen wants to be around the copper, so then it becomes a very clear blue color. And then finally, by adding the water to the nitrogen dioxide, or the NO2 in the graduated cylinder, it's basically, it combines with the water to then provide nitric acid once more and then NO gas. So the proof of that reaction would be through the gas with the color change from the reddish cloudy color to it being clear. And then the liquid, you could tell it changed from being just water to being the nitric acid through like seeing a change in the pH or it becoming more acidic which then I tested with the blue litmus paper and how it turned from blue to red showed that it became more acidic. And that's all, thank you. Burr, it's so cold. I know, and it's so dark. I, Where are we? I can't believe we're stuck in the woods. We need wood, we need a fire. Do you see any? There's gotta be wood around here somewhere. I can't see. Are you guys looking for a fire? Whoa, who are you? I'm the forest witch, and right now I'm brewing this potion. That could be better than a wood fire. A, a potion? Are you sure we don't need wood for a fire? Yeah, you guys should trust me on this one. I have this lighter right here, which I'm sure you guys need. And I have this match. And you can see that this potion is um, almost, almost ready. If I could just have you guys light this. Yeah, stand back. You guys sure you guys want fire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we need it. Oh, Whoa, God. we got a fire. That's awesome. Looks like you didn't need one after all. Yeah, like I told you. Look at that, it's still going. Way better than a wood fire. Hi, I'm Katie, and um, I had Rania and Kobe do my demo with me, and my demo was methane bubbles. So the materials that were used was a five gallon bucket of water, 100 milliliters of dish soap, um, methane, which is CH4, and a heat source. In this case, we used a match and a lighter. So this reaction was where methane reacted with oxygen in the presence of heat to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. And the reason why this reaction was as controlled as it was, was because it was done underwater, which puts out the fire. So it doesn't um, come in contact with any of us. It just is enclosed in the bubble. And this reaction again used methane and oxygen with a heat source and it produced carbon dioxide and water vapor. So this is an example of a combustion reaction, which is a reaction where a hydrocarbon, which is methane, will react with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. And when it does so, it releases energy in the form of heat, and that energy was seen in the form of our fire. Um, so since it produces heat, this is also an example of an exothermic reaction. And an exothermic reaction is just a reaction that releases heat or fire. In the case of our demo, it was um, a big, tall fire. So there's two different types of combustion, complete and incomplete combustion. Complete combustion occurs when there's an unlimited supply of oxygen, and that'll produce carbon dioxide as its um, carbon product, whereas incomplete combustion 
um, occurs under a limited supply of oxygen and it'll produce carbon monoxide as a product because there's less oxygen available. And an example of incomplete combustion is a gas engine combustion. to our show. I am the amazing alchemist and this is my assistant Kobe. Today we will be making something disappear. But first we need a member of our audience to volunteer something to disappear. Oh, oh me, me, pick me, pick me. All right, come yes. on up, come on up. And what's your name? My name's Rania and I'm so excited to be here today. We're excited to have you. Do you have something that I can make disappear for you? Um, oh, does this work? I really hope it will. This is the first time we are doing this trick. All right. You're I can wrong. have my magic wand. Thank you. And if we wouldn't mind taking a few steps back. All right. Here we are, folks. <laughs> it disappeared. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right. So my demonstration was called the Magic Touch, and it was with me as well as my assistant, Kobe, and Rania was our wonderful volunteer. All right, so the materials that you need for this demonstration, you need two 250 milliliter beakers, one 50 milliliter beaker, as well as some filter paper and a funnel. And the two things you're actually mixing together are the iodine crystals and concentrated aqueous ammonia. The amounts of these two compounds really depend on how much you would like to make. That obviously was a very large explosion, so you could use up to four grams, but I highly suggest using only about one if it's the first time. <laughs> All right, so that compound was nitrogen triiodide that we formed. So we did take the iodine crystals and the aqueous ammonia to form the nitrogen triiodide, which is the blackish purple solid that you can still see a little bit there and that you can see on the presentation here. So this is a stable compound when it's wet because the ammonia is able to hold the iodine item ions perfectly in place so they aren't combating each other, making room for e themselves. But as soon as it dries and the aqueous ammonia is gone, it's a free-for-all with all of those atoms and they just bump into each other and make their bonds very weak. This is also an exothermic reaction, a very high yield explosive. Um, so it actually releases heat to the environment. If you go back to where the explosion happened, place your hands right over it, you can literally feel the heat that came from it. And since it is a high yield explosive, this means that the energy released upon detonation is much higher than the energy needed to form the compound, which is why one simple tap was enough activation energy to set it right off. And finally, this is a decomposition reaction. The compound is completely unstable once it is dry because of that central nitrogen atom and its two lone pairs not having enough room. So those iodine atoms and the nitrogen atom are just fighting it, hitting into each other, making their bond super, super weak making them really easy to break and incredibly volatile to the point where they can make something disappear. Thank you. Thank you for watching our chemistry demonstrations program. We hope that you learned something new. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to our DeSales University Chemistry Demonstrations program for the 2020-2021 academic year. My name is Dr. Roger Berg, I'm Associate Professor of Chemistry here at DeSales University and my colleague here is Dr. Fran Mayville, he's also Associate Professor of Chemistry. Uh, more than 20 years ago I had the idea of starting a Chemistry Demonstrations program. However, at the time, we did not have the facilities in which to uh, have that program. However, when we knew that we were going to build the Priscilla Payne Heard Science Center in which we are now uh, located, um, I pursued the idea with my colleagues, and doc Dr. Mabel was one of the, my colleagues at that time, I pursued it, and uh, they gave me unanimous support. And so, uh, 20 years ago, we started our first chemistry demonstrations program the fall semester that we entered uh, this building. And Dr. Mabel can tell you a little bit about that, uh, that beginning. 
Yeah, we started in 2001, which is a long time ago, but we didn't have the facilities before, like Dr. Berg said, but now that we've got this demonstration bench and this auditorium, essentially we can do these demonstrations. So we thought about, now we have the facilities, what do we do? So we thought about talking to students and asking them if they would help us do this. Um, before, we actually went out to high schools and we would present demos in different classes, but we kind of found that to be um, something that took a lot of time and we did, it was kind of a, it was really difficult to actually you know, pass on the information to very many students. So our thought was, let's see if we can put a demo show together so that students can come to us, whether they're elementary, middle school, or high school, and they can see our show and our program, and we can actually have as many groups as we'd like to have here. It makes it easier for us because we can bring all the chemicals down and all the setup here. So that was our first thought. We also decided to bring some students into that program. Uh, and, and that's a very important point that Dr. Ville, Mayville makes. Uh, we could never do this demonstrations program as effectively as we do without students. Uh, that first year, and Dr. Mayville can tell you, uh, we often talk about that first group of students that we had. Uh, my recollection is that we did somewhere around uh, eight to 12 chemistry demonstrations and they were mostly in chemistry, mostly in chemistry, and we tried to, to uh, start the program uh, sometime in late October, early November to coincide with uh, National Chemistry Week, and you might tell us uh, or tell everyone about the, the makeup of that group of students. Sure. Um, you know, we started off asking students if they were interested. We got four science majors and we got four nursing majors, so we had four um, basically um, non-science majors wanting to do these demonstrations and it was uh, the first show was just amazing and it's evolved from there we've gotten more and more students involved with um, the demos mostly science majors biology chemistry biochemistry and um, PA but uh, those first four nursing majors with those first four science majors started this whole thing off and it's and it's interesting we got a really good response from uh, high schools uh, who came here for the, the programs such that um, they encouraged us to have the program not only in the fall but also in the spring. Uh, the list of high schools attending grew. Uh, we expanded it, as you said earlier, we expanded it to uh, middle schools and elementary schools. And uh, up until uh, a year ago, we were presenting the program to between 1,500 and 2,000 students. Uh, in, in all levels, uh, middle school, elementary school, and, and high school. And uh, the program has changed uh, significantly since that first program. Uh, and you can talk about the makeup of the program sure. as it is now. Sure. You know, um, we decided we wanted to make the program really more of a show. Um, so the students start off by finding demos over the summer and um, they bring their demos in, we work with them, the faculty and the students work together on developing those demos. The students take the time to upscale them so that they're visible and presentable. They also work on skits uh, so that basically when they present their demo it has a little bit of, um, a little bit of um, the theatrics. We add some music to that so that we have basically lead-ins and lead-outs. Um, so the program's evolved from 20 years ago and it actually is a pretty fine show now. Now, Dr. Mabel is a, uh, an accomplished uh, musician, and so we rely on him heavily to provide uh, music, not only music uh, for the program, but music that is appropriate for the, for the individual demonstrations. Uh, you touched on something very important, and that is students. Uh, uh, this program is not possible with, uh, without students, and this year has been a real challenge for us with the, the pandemic uh, ever since uh, we started in August. Uh, the, the circumstances uh, that we have this year are quite different than we had the first 19 years. Uh, and so our, our students have had to make adjustments. Uh, we don't have as many uh, upperclassmen in this year's program as we've had in the past. Fortunate we have some really good upperclassmen. But we have a relatively young group, but they adapted quickly and, and uh, were able to, uh, from, from early on, uh, plan and, and uh, practice and then present the program uh, in such a way that uh, I think this year's program is, is really a good one with uh, a lot of variety. And, but if it weren't for students, we wouldn't be able to do it. Um, 
couple years ago, and I'm going to defer to Dr. Mayville to tell me when, we decided that we needed some student leaders. And so we decided that year to select a senior leader, and then a few years after that, a junior leader. And we have two great students, uh, a senior, uh, Rania Nima, who is our uh, student leader uh, in the senior class, and uh, a junior, Kobe Rush, who is uh, first year in that position. Well, we have two great leaders, and they're going to tell you more about the students that are involved in this program. So, Rania, Kobe, why don't you come on? Hi everyone, my name is Rania Nima. I'm the senior leader of chemistry demonstrations this year. Um, I am a senior and this is my third year in the de chemistry demonstrations program. Hi, my name is Kobe Rush. I'm a junior biochemistry major. Uh, I'm the junior leader. Uh, and this is my second year in the program. Uh, we were so excited that we got to actually film a program this year given all the circumstances. It was definitely different from what we're used to. Um, so we did have a lot of challenges, but we also had a lot of positives to uh, have a program this year for you guys. Yeah, and I mean the biggest challenge that we had to face was not being able to perform in front of a live audience. Getting that feedback from the, the students from high school and elementary school, that, that's really important for us and it makes the whole experience a lot more fun. Yeah, and with all those challenges, like I said, we had a lot of positives that we were able to do a lot of different things and show you guys different skits. Uh, we were able to do bigger and better skits and even longer skits because now we didn't have a time constraint on how long each demonstration had to be. So you, normally we would have a live audience and that live audience would have to leave by a certain time, especially because we all have classes afterwards and um, the buses would all have to leave at once. But now that we were able to kind of record it for you guys and send it to you guys in your own schools, we were able to have kind of unlimited time for each skit. So we were able to definitely work that out a lot better. Um, we were also able to have smaller demonstrations that we could kind of zoom in and see it up close. Whereas if we had a live audience, people all the way in the back weren't able to see that. So we definitely were able to have a lot more variety and a lot of different um, kinds of demonstrations and different fields of chemistry that we can show you guys as well. So we do want to introduce all of our participants this year and we're going to start with um, the people who are in it kind of the longest. So our longest people have been in it for three years so far. Okay, so first we're going to start off talking about our third years. Uh, we have two this year. The first one is Rania, who we've already introduced, our senior leader. Maddie Heller is our other third year senior. Uh, she is a chemistry forensics major. Um, now we go into our second years and we have Kobe Rush, which we introduced. He is our junior leader. Um, and we also have Nick Zambo. He is a junior chemistry major. Another second year we have is Heather Hall. She is also a junior chemistry major with a concentration in forensic science. Next up, we have Angela Barhum. She is a junior biology major. Also, Nathan Wong, who is a junior medical studies major. Um, now we go into the people who are new to our chemistry demonstrations program, so our first years. And first up, we have Carl Tice. He is a sophomore biology major in the teaching program as well. We also have Leah Gassion, who is a senior biology major. Anthony Sino, he is a sophomore um, medical studies major and he is in the physician assistant program. Matthew Rita, who is a sophomore biology major. Trisha Tadley, she is a sophomore biology major. Shannon Gorecki, who is a sophomore chemistry major with a criminal justice minor. And last but not least, we have Katie McGrath. She is a sophomore biology and chemistry major. Fantastic show. You all did an amazing job. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm very impressed. I'm very pleased and very satisfied. Guys, what do you think? I thought it was awesome. I loved watching it. Kobe, so what fun. do you think? Yeah, I thought it was great. I loved okay. it. Do you like to watch yourself? Yeah, yeah. That's my favorite thing to do. I love watching myself. You guys did super well. I want to, I want to thank you. It was uh, well done. It was well led. Uh, and, and, and every demo really worked out well. Yeah, you guys did a great job. Really good. Thank you. Well, we want to thank you, but we also want to hear from you, our audience. So we're going to send it over to Dan Volante. Dan, can you tell us how, uh, if we have any questions out there in our audience? Yes, and, and thank you all again. Um, it's funny, I, Joe, Joe actually asked a very similar question to um, what I was thinking was uh, doing this program virtually must be, you know, rather difficult. But 
you know, and, and maybe this COVID time, you know, created a new opportunity, but does it expand the number of viewers, you know, tonight versus that, what that looked like in person and the number of schools, uh, you know, now being able to have it recorded, do you think that will expand um, where this can go? I, I think it gives us a totally different perspective as to how to pre present this program. For 19 years, we've been uh, doing it in person. Uh, we realize now that uh, some schools will not be coming next year or maybe even the year after, but we now have another way of science outreach. And I think uh, that gives us a lot more Flexibility gives us a lot more opportunities uh, to present programs such as this to uh, schools on the outside. Uh, we, we might, I, not might, I think we're going to increase the number of schools who have an interest in this program. Yeah. What do you think, Frank? Yeah, I think we can actually send this out to schools that really are not in the, the general vicinity. A lot of the schools that come to us for our in-person shows are close. Um, but we're going to be able to reach out to, you know, um, schools in New York, schools in Jersey that are further away, maybe even across the country. So yeah, we have a little bit more uh, reach with something like this. And Rania, I remember you saying early on that <clears throat> presenting this program gives us a, a different way of presenting it because we don't have to scale it up. We can show, you might want to speak, you and Kobe might want to speak to that. Yes, one, for example, that I was thinking of was the egg uh, experiment where people in the back row wouldn't be able to see the egg up close and see the reaction going on. But now that we have the equipment to get up close, we can show exactly what's going on. So it gives us different kinds of experiments that we can do and present as well. Yeah, it would have been difficult for Kobe to, to show the spoon coming apart uh, yeah. for someone yeah. all the way in the back. Something small like that, it's really useful to have an up close camera, whereas an audience full of people, anybody in the back would have no idea what's going on, so. Yes, and, and when, that, when that is possible, uh, we can increase the variety too, because there's some demonstrations we haven't done in the past because we've had a difficult time scaling them up and still being safe. And this way we could do them on a small scale and, and be safe. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that's an important factor. Uh, Kobe, Rania, safety safety is always an issue for us, and we make sure that everything we do is done in a safe way and all of our presenters are protected with uh, the equipment that they need. You might want to speak to that? Yes, not just even the presenters, but even people who are in person, we have to be aware that they might be in the first two rows and we have to make sure they have goggles as well as being as protective as possible. Um, so with this, again, you guys aren't in any danger, you're just watching it. So that's also another plus side of having this um, online and recorded instead. Great, we have a couple more questions and, and Jim actually we, we kind of took the words out of my mouth on the second question I was gonna ask is, um, you know, obviously well done. Um, but, you know, in the future, do we think that maybe we could get alumni involved as possible volunteers, especially if we do these pre-recorded, you know, episodes, um, something that, you know, they may be able to be involved with in the future? Thoughts on that? Uh, I would love if we could have alumni from each of the, of the uh, previous 19 and now 20 years come back and do a chem demos program with our current students. That'd be fantastic. Uh, Jim, are you volunteering to do that? If you're volunteering to do that, we might form a committee for you to get some of the alums together and bring them on campus. Uh, that would be that would be fantastic. Uh, I've often thought about that. I just don't know would be the the best time to do that. A parents' weekend, maybe. But I like the idea, and I hope there is enough interest on the part of alums. You don't even have to be part of the of the program in the past, you can come and, and uh, participate in the program. I know Dr. Mabel would, would like that as well. Sure. You know, I think um, anyone could come to the campus and when we're working on these, these videos, um, certainly, if you want to be involved, we'd love to have you. I'll be Great. in two days, so sign me up. Yeah, that's right. good. That's right. two days. And you, and you know, when you come, bring, bring a little money so we can really upscale, <laughs> upscale the Chem Demos program. That would be a fantastic uh, opportunity there. 
Yeah, these, these programs aren't cheap. We, uh, we have to buy all the chemicals and all the supplies. So yeah, we could use some money. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I, I, think, I think we have the most comments after, after uh, you know, a couple, a couple of questions there. Um, seems like there's definitely some interest. Um, going to Julianne's comment, um, will in-person demos be back in the, in the fall? And will you continue to keep the show virtually for alumni who want to see the presentations? Are they going to be think, back in the fall? What is your yeah. plans for fall right now? We, uh, we actually had a, a memo back and forth last week. And um, what we finally decided was uh, we don't think the schools know yet how they're going to begin their year. Uh, they don't know what opportunities they will have on field trips. So our position is going to be we're going to go back to what we did two years ago. We're going to draft a letter with dates, uh, send that letter to our pool of schools that have come in the past and see what the response is. Uh, but I would definitely like to, and, and, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Mabel and, and Kobe, we've talked uh, before, uh, we would like to do at least two in person, a public one and, and parents weekend. Uh, we'd like to do that. But since we've had the experience of uh, videotaping, we, uh, we, we don't have to do it in segments now. We could videotape a whole program yeah. and have that available. So I think we're going to go uh, with in-person as well as taping. And I think that offers uh, more opportunities than we've had. And Fran, you may want to talk to uh, the, the public performance that we do, uh, typically in an evening yeah. setting. So usually fall and spring semester, we'll run a demos program at night for visitors, family, alums, anybody who'd like to come back to campus to see that show. Um, it's usually a Wednesday night. We usually try to figure out what night works best for our group and also the, the people that are interested in coming to the campus. Um, and I think having both, I think having both venues is a really good thing now. We found something brand new, something new that we can do, um, and that's just to record everything we do and have, um, now we can actually keep these things and have them in the archives. Um, so yeah, I think we, we want to do both. We don't know what we're going to get in the fall. We don't know what schools are doing, whether they're not necessarily traveling for another year. Um, so we'll see what happens, but I definitely think we want to do both if we can do that. Awesome. We did, we did have a question. Sitting in the auditorium of the Hurt Science Center, and we've used this setting to do our chem demos program in person. Uh, right now, we may only have uh, less than half the capacity, so we just don't know. Our school's going to have to social distance, uh, how far apart. Uh, right now, this, this room could uh, hold over 100, close to 120 with additional seating. It still only gives us about uh, 40, 40 uh, in person with social distancing. So we just have to wait and see what we can do and what schools can do. Well, thank you. I know we had one more question, which I um, took the honor. Uh, uh, and I say that because Jacob, our, our, our 2021 videographer has been with us basically all year and has done an amazing job. This has just been, you know, the icing on the cake, but he's been with us for dinner dance, for homecoming. Um, so, um, I did, I did answer that question, but he's been great and, and he deserves a ton of credit along with, you know, those who are, who are with us tonight. Um, that's, that's all the questions we have right here. Um, it, it, it you know, it sounds like we, we definitely at, at the end gained an alumni following for some, some chem demos in person. I, I think we have four or five people who said they would love to come back to do so. So, um, definitely created some, some, some future opportunities too. That's for sure. We want to thank you guys for you know tuning in to watch what we've been working on for the past I don't know month or two. Um, we also want to thank Jacob. Jacob did an amazing job with just having all the shots and and um, worked through the PowerPoint so that they were highlighted, picked out the the initial scenery and things like that, and it was just amazing to work with he and Jackie. Jackie was right there when we were picking out the music, and um, so yeah, I think. Um, you guys deserve a big hand, and Rania and Kobe, amazing. We can't do this without, without these students. They're just amazing people, and they work really hard to put this program together, and it's so awesome.
Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Justin? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just in conclusion, I want to echo Dr. Mabel's comments. Uh, you can't see Jacob. We can see Jacob. Uh, he has put in so much time, I think we ought to give him an honorary BS degree in, in chemistry uh, for doing what he has done. Uh, and, and, and this lady to my right, uh, fantastic, fantastic considering where we were two months ago and where we have, where we have gone and, and what we have had tonight. Uh, and alums, I want to thank you alums out there. Uh, if you can make it happen, uh, please contact us. We would love to include you in any public performance, uh, even a taping. If, if you would like to be involved in a taping, we, we will make accommodations for you. We, we love our alums. We love to include them as much as we can. So contact us and we'll do what we can to include you, whether it's in person, in video, or both. Well, thank you so much. Again, here at DeSales University, we're definitely a big family, and tonight's presentation was no, like no other, and um, I, we appreciate all of you at home for watching, and thank you to this entire team, and um, Dan, over to you. Yeah, and, and obviously I'd like to just conclude by really thanking you know the five of you who are, who are sitting in front of us tonight, and Jacob, who are back there, because you know as we talked about so many times, you know, there's been such negative and such bad that has happened through COVID, but there are some positives and some opportunities like tonight that, you know, this would have really never happened without us getting together and really, you know, you guys coming together and, and finding a way on the 20th anniversary to, to still make it happen and, and, and create something that really might have new opportunities for us to, to move to, you know, in person and alumni and, and reaching students in New York, what we heard tonight is just like, hey, th this could become its own um, marketing tool for future students to come to the sales too. Um, so, so we're so thankful for everybody who joined us tonight, the alumni support. Um, we're looking forward to being able to present uh, the recording on our YouTube channel. It will be, it's, it's the Sales University Alumni YouTube. You can go find all of our Virtual Scholars episodes. And again, we're, we're looking forward to seeing you all soon and have a great night. Well done, everyone. Thank you all.